I'm going to talk very quickly about what we've seen in the responders who did rescue and recovery work at the World Trade Center disaster site um, following the attack on those towers on September 11, 2001. And much of what I'm going to talk about very briefly results from three areas of our work. One, we have a Center for Occupational and Environmental Medicine at Mount Sinai um, that really began to see the responders first and where a certain amount of clinical experience was accumulated that gave us a feel for what the real health consequences short term were among these responders as a result of their exposures and what they witnessed down there. But then we did get a federally funded um, treatment program, I mean, a, a screening program up and running um, to proactively reach out to World Trade Center responders uh, rather than just being in passive mode as a clinic. Um, and by now we've screened some 20,000 responders. And we also eventually got funding for a treatment program. And all those sources of clinical information really shape what I'm going to talk about today. And then I'm going to focus a little bit on the asbestos aspect of the World Trade Center disaster. This, the photographs I'm going to show you, for the most part, were not taken by professional photographers, but rather by iron workers and other construction, construction workers who can take their cameras with them to any site and take some remarkable photographs. I don't know how well this shows up in this lighting, but this picture was taken in the mid-afternoon of September 11th. And you can see that it looks like dusk because there's so much aerosolized particulate um, that blocks out the sun and also represents what some of the exposure hazard was. Um, this shows the tower hit um, the, the, uh, shortly after it was hit by the airplane. The point here is that an enormous amount of jet fuel was released when those planes hit the towers. That jet fuel burned and caused its own respiratory hazard as well as some other hazards, but also dissected down through the buildings Right, and lit rooms on fire well below where the impact zone was. And we have many patients who had smoke inhalation, burns, um, and uh, genuine post-traumatic stress disorder as a result of what they experienced simply from that fuel burning. This is a photograph uh, that shows the beginning of the collapse of the towers. And aside from the horror of that event, it really makes a very important point that's relevant to our concerns. And that is that those towers, rather than toppling, in fact, pancaked. They imploded with enormous impaction forces. And you heard a little discussion earlier this morning of the issue of short asbestos fiber and its potential health consequences. I can tell you that this collapse phenomenon fragmented asbestos, and we'll talk about how, how much was present in those buildings, in a way that's unusual for a construction or demolition site, that the, if you look at the size distribution of the fiber found, not by governmental agencies, unfortunately, but by private industrial um, uh, consultants, uh, industrial hygiene consultants, the fiber distribution was shifted way towards the shorter fractions, in large part because of this tremendous impaction force that the fibers were subjected to, but it also pulverized everything else, including the, all the construction materials that were present in those buildings. And anyone who was down at that pile knows that you couldn't see an intact desk, an intact computer, an intact telephone. Everything was reduced to relatively small rubble. And what you, th this shows just how much of an explosive cloud of dust that generated. And this shows how extensively that cloud spread throughout all of lower Manhattan, eventually rising up and being carried by prevailing winds over Brooklyn, eventually over Staten Island, and over towards the New Jersey area. This photograph, I, I think, um, illustrates an important point. This was taken in the afternoon of 9-11. For the most part, what you see here are firefighters Right, and you can see that just about the only individual wearing a respirator um, on this site is that one, despite all this aerosolized material, dust and smoke, and he's wearing it around his neck. Um, that problem of the provision of and the use of adequate respiratory protection played a very large role in the health consequences that we're seeing both in the short run now and the health consequences that we're worried about in the future. This photograph illustrates, I think, some very um, important features of that environment. You can, this is an iron worker who's climbing over some of the structural steel that fell to the top of the pile. This is taken the, e the, the, the evening of 9-11. And you can see just how dangerous an environment this was physically 
never mind chemical exposures and inhalation exposures, th this heavy steel was sitting on top of a pile that itself rested on five floors of sub-street level voids, right? Empty space. So you had a huge amount of material, tons and tons of material sitting on top of empty space. Heavy cranes were brought into the area that sat on top of the pile to move heavy steel. Right? So this was always a dangerous environment. The underfooting was dangerous. There was so much dust in the air that there were attempts to suppress dust entrainment into the air by using hoses that wet all the underfooting so that people were slipping and sliding all over the place. And by Friday, it rained. Tuesday was the event. Friday, it rained, again, creating you know, a, a physical hazard for many people, even though it probably improved the dust exposure circumstances. You can see that this individual is wearing boots and gloves and a hard hat, but no respiratory protection. This gives you a feel for how widespread this finely pulverized dust um, pervaded all of the area of, of Lower Manhattan. This was taken about a block and a half away from the Ground Zero site itself, and everything is covered by this fine gray-white material. And when analyzed mineralogically, it is predominantly pulver pulverized concrete and gypsum from all the wallboard and concrete in construction. It contained a, a number of other um, chemical entities as, as well, but the fact that it contained pulverized concrete had certain implications because pulverized concrete, in fact, has a very high pH. It's highly alkaline with a pH of about 10 to 11. So essentially, when people inhaled this material, and they did, um, they were inhaling what is essentially as alkaline as Drano and did cause respiratory burns. Um, anyone who has worked with wet cement or taken care of workers who work with wet cement knows that when that material is applied to the skin and left there, it produces a corrosive burn. And that will happen in the respiratory tract as well, and that accounts for much of the short-term health consequence we've observed. Here you see people fleeing the building after the collapse of towers, and you can see they're totally dusted. The issue for us, obviously, was not what was on the outside, but what got inhaled into the um, respiratory tract, in part what was swallowed into the digestive tract. And many of these individuals who fled, who evacuated the site, were in the area for only about 10 or 15 minutes, had new onset asthma, having never had asthma in their lives before. I like to show this photograph because it illustrates an important exposure point, and that is that this huge plume of black sooty smoke was commonly present over the first month and a half, those fires that generated such plumes continued through December. And even though the prevailing winds are from west to east in lower Manhattan, and these, that firefighter and that construction worker are really upwind from the plume, as this picture was taken, the winds shift in lower Manhattan frequently. And what we got as reports from many of the responders we examined was that often they would be caught in the, these plumes, again, without respiratory protection. And in part, it depended on the color of the plume, just how nasty the exposure was. That there was a particular yellowish cloud that would sometimes appear, depending on what was burning underneath all that debris. And that seemed to be associated with immediate irritant effects as well as longer term health consequences and we don't know what was in that stuff largely because no monitoring was done at the site for three full days except for monitors that had been in place there prior to 9-11 quite accidentally because NYU's environmental science group was doing air pollution studies and had a few monitors scattered in lower Manhattan that provided some useful data but we have no information over the first few days when the exposures were most intense most consequential from a health um, point of view um, to know what the quantitative and qualitative aspects of the exposures were. When those towers collapsed, it produced an enormous pressure wave. Some people, engineers, have estimated that it's virtually at hurricane force wind. I have a patient who was literally lifted off of his feet. He was standing outside the buildings having escaped when the building, when the tower collapsed. He was thrown about 25 feet down the street and then buried under debris. Um, but that also blew out all the windows in the adjacent buildings, both office buildings and residential space, allowing the intrusion of this dust into all these interior spaces, accumulating to as much as six inches on some of the surf surfaces. And that dust that intruded into these interiors has been analyzed by, again, unfortunately, only non-governmental industrial hygienists, but nevertheless, 
some very experienced people, and it contained as much as 4% asbestos by weight, unevenly distributed, as, as you would expect, but nevertheless present, and the people who cleaned up all this dust, those immigrant workers who did not speak English and were hired by building service contractors who often didn't pay them, worked in these enclosed spaces, essentially, cleaning up the, the dust with dry methods, unfortunately, without respiratory protection, without any um, education to advise them as to what they were at risk for. And you can imagine if you were a parent and came back to your home and found this sort of thing with the high chair and the teddy bear coated with this fine gray-white powder, you would be at some loss to know whether this was an inhabitable space, whether this was something you could clean up yourself, and not to take too many gratuitous shots at agencies, but the New York City Department of Health's advisories to people in Lower Manhattan was use wet methods, maybe get a HEPA vac, and clean it up yourself. Um, this had, I think, an enormous um, a damaging effect on people's understanding of the potential hazard. But then again, you had a problem of many people renting apartments who were not very wealthy people, had no insurance coverage for this sort of thing, and the cost of cleaning up a two-bedroom apartment in Lower Manhattan dealing with this kind of dust was somewhere in the order of seven to ten thousand dollars. Right, so many people found themselves in a position economically of having to do something about this themselves and some developed illness as a consequence. What were the exposures? Very quickly, um, pulverized cement and gypsum. We've talked about pulverized glass because those towers were literally, and the skeleton was partly plate glass. You could not see intact plate glass you know, after those towers collapsed. Um, and asbestos was present in silica for obvious reasons. Um, fibrous glass, because, and I'll show this in a moment, um, after they no longer used asbestos as a spray on insulation at the World Trade Center towers, they, they began using fibrous glass. Heavy metals were present, although no heavy metal poisonings were found among all the responders that were tested, over 3,000. Um, and importantly, the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, the combustion products that are present in cigarette smoke that are carcinogenic, were found adherent to fibrous materials and particulates. Um, we began seeing patients on October 1st had upper airway inflammatory responses as well as lower airway inflammatory responses, we believed largely because of the inhalation of that highly alkaline material. Some were inhaling other materials, combustion products, which are irritant, but this um, alkaline dust we think was the main culprit agent. Um, where you were, when you got there, what you did down there, and whether you wore respiratory protection was a big influence on dose. Um, and those people who had sinus or respiratory problems before were much worse after their exposures. I don't want to talk about this. Psychological effects, many people were down there who had never witnessed human trauma and the horror of this sort of thing before and suffered enormous psychological consequences, complicated only by the fact that their attempts to get workers' compensation benefits and find ways to get medical care for their problems were fought tooth and nail by the insurance companies in New York State. And many had a year and a half wait before their cases were established so that they could get medical care, and many had no insurance. Um, we did get um, a, a screening program up and running. We began seeing people in July after getting our funding in April. The Queen's Center that Dr. Miller was talking about was one of the consortium of institutions we put together to provide these exams. And we have now seen some 20,000. I will only make this point. This was an attempt to find people who are ill and refer them for appropriate care. We were instructed by the workers and responders and their unions, this is not an epidemiological study. We are not gonna be research fodder for your academic careers. We wanna be taken care of. And we were, they were very explicit about that. Nevertheless, they wanted us to learn what we could and we have learned some. And it, our most recent findings were published this past September um, in Environmental Health Perspectives. Um, it's, it's, you can find it online. Most of the people we saw were construction workers, many police officers. The firefighters in New York City had their own parallel program funded by the federal government. Um, and the major clinical findings was that, that even though the great majority of these responders were symptom-free during the year prior to 9-11, many, many had lower respiratory symptoms, chest, tightness, cough, shortness of breath, and wheezing while they were down there, but that's not such a surprise. The fact that these symptoms persisted to the time of their examination on average, an eight-month period elapsed since the time they were on the pile to the time we examined them, some even as long as two years after their experiences down there. Many, many were still symptomatic, about a third with chest symptoms, 
And as you can see here, nearly 50% had upper respiratory symptoms of sinus congestion, facial pain, post-nasal drip, typical symptoms of sinusitis. Some of our patients have had two successive sinus surgeries. If you know anyone who's gone through one sinus surgery, you don't repeat that unless there's really absolute misery in your life. And we've had patients who have gone through two such things and are still not well. Um, I'm going to finish up quickly with a couple more points. Breathing tests, which are our objective measure, had about a 28% rate of abnormality. When we looked at the non-smokers, they were twice the rate of abnormality found in the big N. Haynes epidemi epidemiological study. And what's very striking is it was not obstructive. We did not see mainly evidence of airway obstruction when we did these breathing tests, but rather what's known as restrictive patterns. People who couldn't fully inflate their lungs with a full breath of air and expel it with a, a forced exhalation. But when we gave them bronchodilators, many of these individuals returned to normal, which really indicated to us that this was really what we call air trapping. It was an obstructive phenomenon, leaving air trapped in the chest, making the ability to fully inflate the lungs more limited. And when we did high resolution CTs at the end of expiration, we could see evidence of what's called microemphysema, the air trapping. Um, this is a very experienced hand. He's an iron worker known as a pusher. He's a working foreman. And we knew him since 1993 because our clinical center follows iron workers for lead exposure on bridges. And we were trying to find ways to reduce lead exposure. He was a very savvy individual. He knows everything that's going on, like that beam swinging over his head in this dangerous environment. Um, but you see this structural steel beam with this gray woolly stuff at the bottom? You know what that stuff is? That's as best to sprayed on insulation. You can see that much of it's delaminated. And that's why when they measured the in bulk samples on the pile, the, the rubble, they found levels as high as 4%, again, unevenly distributed in the pile. He's not wearing respiratory protection either. And here's why all that asbestos was present, because these are, these are photographs taken during the construction of the World Trade Center in 1969, 1970. Dr. Selikoff um, was invited by the Department of Environmental Protection in New York City to go down because they were worried that all the cars in Lower Manhattan were being dusted as they sprayed this insulation material on the structural steel beams, which was required by law by building code at the time. You couldn't build a high-rise building without spraying asbestos on the steel beams. And the issue was not to worry about health so much because no one worried about this laborer who's spraying there. You can see how you know, he's not wearing any respiratory protection. The issue was the dusting of the cars at first. And then when they measured asbestos at high concentrations downwind in Brooklyn, the issue of health became much more um, to the fore, and the city council in New York City in 1971 banned the spray application of asbestos in New York City. The EPA followed a year later, banning it nationwide. And it was the World Trade Center experience that gave rise to that public policy, which was an important public policy. You can see that as they spray this stuff, some of it gets on the beams, as Dr. Solkoff used to say. Um, Here's another, this is spray of the interior of the World Trade Center. Again, you can see how much overspray occurs. Here's a picture of um, structural steel members with this woolly insulation on it. And we were talking about industrial electricians and sheet metal workers before. You can see why sheet metal workers get disease. Because this guy scraped the stuff off to work on that junction box. That sheet metal worker to work on that duct, scraped off the asbestos. No one had warned these people. They wore no respiratory protection, which is why we see high rates of asbestos-related disease on the x-rays of senior tradespeople like this. But the entire area inside the World Trade Center was littered with asbestos from this spray application. You can see it on this um, little shelf there. And the only point I want to make about asbestos now is that we have no idea Number one, how much was really used in the World Trade Center because all the purchasing documents went up in smoke when those buildings in fact collapsed and burned. But we have anecdotal information from many of the workers who worked to construct that, those two towers who are still alive, who remember very well how much was used and even after the ban of the asbestos use and, and, and spray in the construction of these buildings, all those bags that were warehoused down there found their way into spray either mixed with the new non-asbestos material or simply used by contractors because this stuff was not going to be wasted, right? This, this costs money, and they knew very well, these, these workers who were involved in the construction, that tremendous amounts the, from sub-basement all the way up to the top-level floors of the elevator shafts were sprayed with this material, and we know that some of the floors 
19 in one tower as suggested and maybe 20 some in the other tower were sprayed with asbestos in the structural steel before the ban went into effect. The question really is for us now in following this population, What's the real risk of developing asbestos-related disease among all these responders? Never mind all the people who returned too early to work in Lower Manhattan because the EPA said their quality was good and workers were required by their employers to come back to work. And never mind all those community residents who came back. If we just look at the responder population, what's the risk of asbestos-related disease and other cancers among them? We don't know. Very few monitoring data are available to us. If you look at occupationally exposed populations, whether we're talking about pipe covers or boiler makers or pipe fitters who work a 30 year lifetime in clouds of asbestos dust or did, the rates of disease among most of them would not suggest that an exposure of two to three months at much lower levels than were encountered by these tradespeople in their usual work will not yield a huge wave of disease down the road. And I'm not suggesting no disease will result, but there have been ideas that we're gonna see a huge avalanche of asbestos related disease 20 years down the road. And I, for one, don't believe that's likely. I'm not saying there is no risk associated with this, but I think our population has been to a certain extent terrorized, you know, by fears of this issue. But that does not mean as a matter of public policy we should not monitor this group and use the best tools that we have and will develop over the next decade in early detection so that in fact if people should develop asbestos related diseases we can find them at a time that's treatable. The worst that might happen from such an approach is that we might find some disease that's not related to the World Trade Center but to exposures that may have predated their World Trade Center experience or postdated it and God forbid that we should find disease that's not related to the World Trade Center and take care of these people that we call heroes, you know, even though it might not be World Trade Center related. So these are questions of social policy that we're wrestling with right now um, that go beyond the question right now of medicine and science. And with that, I will shut up. <laughs>